Hello, and welcome back to Life Groups. I'm so glad you joined us here tonight, and I hope you're having as much fun and good times as I've been having at Life Groups, this wonderful ministry. And I just want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting it. And let's also thank our host. Give them a hand of appreciation for opening up their home, letting us come in and enjoy this wonderful occasion of fellowship and connection and the Word of God. Um, I'm coming to you tonight from a different location. As you can see, the backdrop's a little bit different. If I'm a little pale, forgive me. I've struggled today with a horrible migraine that culminated in throwing up. And so uh, I'm about 70% here, but I am still excited to teach this lesson tonight and be a part of Life Groups because what God's doing at Life Church is just amazing. Wow, what an incredible revival that we just had Sunday and Monday. And if you missed Monday night, oh, wow, what a service. I love it when the power of God floods in so strong that people are still praying 45, 50 minutes, hour after the preaching has ended. And that's what we had last night, tongues and interpretation, moving of the spirit. God is up to great things. I'm so glad to be a part of it. And I'm glad you are too. Let me make a few announcements. Friday night, youth game night at the McKissick's home. Any questions, contact brother and sister McKissick. Let's make sure our youth are there. What a wonderful job they're doing. And then Saturday at noon, our ladies are getting together for their Mother's Day luncheon. That's at 12 p.m. at Por Favor in El Cajon. They're gonna have a wonderful time. See Sister Barone if you have any questions or need any kind of details concerning that. And then of course, Sunday, we're right back with Christian Development at 10 a.m. and then our Mother's Day service at noon. And we have some special guests, some of our own ladies are going to be speaking. We're gonna have a fantastic Mother's Day as we always do at Life Church. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into our lesson tonight. Uh, about a year ago, I was reading through some uh, men's journal magazine or some some something to do with survival. And I came across an article and when I read it, I thought that would be a fantastic lesson for life groups. And it was an article that was written to help people know what to do should they become lost in the woods. And so I kind of took from the lesson, condensed it down for you tonight. And I know you're going to enjoy this because when I read it, I thought there's so many life principles that we could examine and bring to a life group lesson. So what do you do should you get lost in the woods? Now, of course, we're going to talk about lost. And we don't mean tonight when we say lost as in on the way to hell lost. Uh, because the answer to that kind of loss is very simple. Jesus said, be born again of water and spirit. How does a person do that? They repent of their sins. They're baptized completely underwater, having the name of Jesus said over them to wash away those sins. And then they're filled with the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit, evidenced initially by speaking in tongues. And then as that believer begins to mature from day to day, the other evidence begins to be the fruits of the Spirit. So that's how a person is escapes being lost for eternity. But we're talking about in this lesson how a trial can come along, how a situation can arise and we can lose our way, get very discombobulated and, and can't figure out where we are, what to do. So we're going to take a look at this lesson. I hope you'll enjoy it. The first thing that they pointed out on what to do if you become lost in the woods, and this was some preventive advice and you know, there's an old saying that says an ounce of prevention is better than a gallon of cure. One of the best things they said was to, before you leave for your journey, be sure and tell someone where you're going and when you plan to return. In your notes, accountability, that's your fill-in. 
accountability. Let's talk about accountability. Now to some, boy, that's an ugly word, but we all need to be accountable to someone. No one is above accountability. Even pastor has men that I am accountable to because a person without accountability is in a, a very scary place. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, if you remember that verse, it says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Verse 10, for if they fall, one shall lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falls because he doesn't have another to help him up. Accountability is something everybody needs. When I counsel people who are struggling, particularly like with an addiction, the ones that I have seen make it are the ones who will take my advice that they need an accountability partner. They need someone who they'll check in with every day and will allow them to check on them, to have that sense of accountability. If people will do that, their success rate is way higher than the man or woman who shrugs it off, who, who feels like this is nonsense. That person's deceiving themselves. We need people. Look around the room you're in. You need those people. James 5 and 16 says, confess your faults one to another and pray for another that you may be healed. We always quote the last part of this verse as it continues on, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But James tagged that to being accountable confessing your faults one to another and praying for one another. Even married folks, you need to understand you are accountable to each other. My wife and I, we make a habit of checking in. We let each other know on the way home, see you in a bit. We never like this cavalier attitude that I see on people that feel like that they're independent particularly you married folks, when you get married, you become one. One. People that I have dealt with who committed adultery, 100% of the time have a cavalier attitude, independent, I don't have to be accountable to anybody, and that leads to destruction. Your husband, your wife sh should be able to go through your phone. I know it. I, I know some of you are smiling. You don't like that. This is 2024. I am woman. Hear me roar. Or was that 1964? But 2024, we're independent. I don't need someone looking on my shoulder. I didn't marry my mom. I married my woman that I love. Don't be silly. It's so much bigger than that. Being accountable to each other. I don't have secrets from my wife. She doesn't have secrets from me. We're accountable to each other. And a good way to not get lost is to have accountability partners, people you trust, people you can contact. Now, for time's sake, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the other side of this, that if someone comes and confides into you a struggle, please do not go tell somebody else. If you do that, then I pray that a thousand ants crawl on you and bite you. Don't do that. If someone comes to you and confesses a struggle, be mature enough to go to God and pray and ask God, how can I be the best help in this person's life who humbled themselves enough to come to me and trust me to tell me a struggle that I can pray for them and it become the effectual, fervent prayer that gets a lot accomplished. So number one, Accountability. Let somebody know before you go out on this trip, this magazine article said, let someone know where you're going, when you plan to come back. That way, if you don't make it back, they can tell the authorities, I know where they were going and when they're supposed to be back. And then in your notes, they talked about what they call the STOP method, S-T-O-P. And I thought this was such a great deal. Should you become lost on your journey, 
stop. And we're going to start with the first one, the acronym using S. And it said for stop, in your notes, you fill in, stop moving for now. Stop moving for now. I thought this was such a great thing because they said, if you figure out you're lost, stop for a moment. Don't keep going because you can get further and further off the path. And if you're lost and you keep moving, you can make it worse. I've seen people make some mistakes and instead of stopping and getting back on course, they keep going and make it way worse. And when they finally get to counseling and I finally get to talk to them, I'm like, bro, sis, if you'd have just talked to me about this a month ago, we, we could have remedied this very quickly. And now we got so much more mess to get you out of, more terrain for you to cover to get back to where you should be. So when you realize you made a mistake, stop it. If you blew it last night, don't blow it again today. Stop. Take that moment. Stop. Stop moving. Find a spot so you can get to the next phase. And that is T in your fill-ins. Think. That's your fill-in. Think. So they said if you find that you're lost, stop moving. And then think. Now, I put in, in my notes, not only do you think, but don't panic. And the reason we don't panic is because fear did not come from God. God has not given us a spirit of fear or anxiety or panic attacks. You got to think. You got to breathe. When you blow it, get your mind right. Like our preacher preached last night taking all those thoughts and bringing them into captivity. Think, ask yourself questions. How did I get here? Where did I get off the path? These are great questions to ask yourself when you fall. How did I get here? Now you've heard me teach it kind of tongue in cheek when I do that no one slips and falls into sin. That you're not just casually walking and all of a sudden slip, fall into adultery and or slip and get drunk. It doesn't happen that way. It's a thought process. We, we, we thought it, then we did it. And so we have to, once we realize we're lost, we got to say, how did I get here? And when we figure that out, then we can figure out how to get back on track and how to never let it happen again. So they said, stop, think, and the next is observe. That's the O, observe. Stop, think, observe. They said, once you stop moving and you start thinking, where did I get off? Where, where, how, how, how did this happen? Then you start to look. You get your compass out. Get your map out. You start to look for landmarks to get you back on the course of where you're supposed to be going. And when they talked about the compass and the map, I thought, oh, I've got a map. It's the word of God. It's the light into my pathway. It's the map to show me how to get from initial salvation all the way to heaven. I got a map. Don't ever Go on your journey without your map. It's your compass. It, it'll show you which direction to go. And when it talked about finding a landmark, and they were talking about finding something that you can say, oh, okay, there's the hill that I need to get to. There's the mountain. Find a landmark. I thought about the greatest landmark for every Christian. It's a cross, Calvary. Whenever you're lost, find Calvary. Get back to Calvary. It, it stands far above any sin. 
It stands far above any situation, any valley, any anything that comes against you. If you will stop, you'll think and you'll look. You can find the cross and make your way back to Jesus. And you'll do it by reading your word, getting your word out, looking through the word as it navigates all the way to the cross. And once you've found a landmark, now you have a direction. The fourth thing they said to do whenever you're lost is plan. You got to make a plan. That's the P, plan. That's your fill in. Plan. You got to get a plan to get back to where you need to be. Now, they say that the number one reason that people die in the wilderness when they're lost, it's not because of dehydration. It's not because of injury, even though a lot of people get injured when they're lost. The number one reason that people die when they're lost is of shame. Shame kills more people that are lost than animals, than the weather, than injuries, than a lack of resources. Shame kills them. It smothers them. It's the shame of saying, how did I do this? The shame of how stupid could I be to make this mistake? The shame of maybe you had people that were with you that you were leading and you let them down. Shame. Shame is a powerful emotion. Shame will kill you if you allow it. And if you've messed up and got off the path, you lost your way, shame is going to be your number one enemy. And when Satan comes to you, that's what he's bringing a gallon of. Shame. Look at you. You are running the aisle Sunday. Look at you now. Look at you. You're a leader in the church. What did you do? Look at you. You're supposed to be all holy and righteous. Look at you. Shame. The enemy brings shame on us. But we have to remind ourselves that when you are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. We don't live under shame. God never shames us. He will convict us. And thank God for that. The Holy Ghost will convict you. But the difference between conviction and condemnation is conviction offers hope. It says you blew it. Now change. I got something better for you. Condemnation says you blew it. And there's nothing for you. The reason Satan wants you to feel that way is because that's where he lives. He made a mistake and God kicked him out of heaven and he will never be allowed in. And he knows that judgment day is coming and he and his angels and the people that rejected God's plan for salvation will be thrown into a lake of fire. He knows he can't find repentance. He lives under shame. That's why he's so eager to throw shame on you and to bring up your past. But in your notes, right out to the side, when Satan brings up your past, you bring up his future. Anytime Satan reminds you of your mistakes, you remind him that I found an altar of repentance, but you never will, and I'm going to heaven and you're going to burn in fire for eternity. Don't let shame kill you. Get a plan. And that plan is I'm getting up. I'm making things right. I'm getting back in the fight. You got to wipe the blood off of your face. You got to wipe the dust, the dirt off of you. You got to get up. You got to make some apologies. And you got to make a plan to never do it again. Go back. You th Remember, you were thinking, how'd I get here? And once you figure that out, then you start to get a plan to never do it again. How do I get out of this? I got a plan now. 
I've got my landmarks. I've found Calvary. I've got my map. I've got my Bible. I'm thinking. I'm pushing away shame. I'm not making it worse. I'm not continuing on. I'm stopping. Once an individual does this, they stop. They think. They observe. They plan. You will get out of any situation you wander off into. No matter how far off the path you get, the good news is God will always help you back. I hope you enjoyed this lesson as much as I did reading it and the applications of it. God bless you. I'll see you on Sunday.